Welcome to Simple Conversation with ASG. Hello, Mike. Can you hear me? I can hear you. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Not too bad. How's Hollywood? It's a hellhole. <laughs> does that have anything to do with the, the whole ritual's propaganda going on at the moment, does it? <laughs> you know, it's just uh, the idea of Hollywood itself is uh, a nice one but if you actually go there there's some bad areas there there's a lot of a lot of a lot of uh unscrupulous people hanging out there i can imagine i can imagine it seems that whole area of california is about it's about unnerving yeah you know it surprises me when uh, i see uh i feel bad kind of when i see people um <laughs> vacationing there because i don't think it's what they expected <laughs> It's probably not. You need to go around with your Instagram printed on your T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so, I suppose we'll get started then as we mean to go on. It's Sunday, I suppose, we're both better things to to do and my family to spend time with, so may as well get it out and, out of the way. No, this is all I got. This is all I got. Good to hear, good to hear. So, tell me, who is Mike Knox? So, I... Uh... I'm retired law enforcement. Uh, I am a stand-up comedian now and a full-time actor and writer. I've written two books, uh, one about my time in, uh, when I worked as a prison guard, and the other one was uh, about my daughter's epilepsy. My daughter's had epilepsy since the age of two, and she received a, a vagus nerve stimulator, which has actually saved her life, and she's been seizure-free for seven years. And so that is how I spend my time now, uh, doing a lot of writing and uh, stand-up comedy and acting. It's incredible to hear about your daughter. It's definitely seems to be now as like kind of the movement, technology and stuff. Diseases like epilepsy are it seems to be not easier treated, but there seems to be more option for them. If you know what I mean? There's there's a lot more, and, and uh, the the vagus nerve stimulator has been around for over twenty years, and still there's not a lot of uh, doctors that know about it or people that know about it. So that's another thing that I do is I I try to do as much as I can to reach out to families um, through the um, company that actually made the VNS because uh, I didn't know anything about it. We went five years when we had a doctor that never mentioned it, never said anything about it. So my daughter could have gotten it a lot, a lot earlier than she did. Yeah. I seen on your, uh, on your website, the link to epilepsy Hollywood. Yeah. And I, I was kind of like reading up, reading on like their articles and the things like the about us page and stuff. And it, it is quite interesting because you, you, to be honest, you never really hear of like, a hub for specifically epilepsy you always kind of think it's through a hospital or general kind of medical practices yeah and a lot of uh i meet a lot of parents that are too uh because you're living in crisis and fear so they're afraid to have another surgery um you know we were we were originally looking at brain surgery and this is such an easier it's a 45 minute to an hour and my daughter was back home eating uh, mcdonald's playing with her friends so she bounced back very quickly and um you know, it's just 24 hours. I call it her bodyguard. It's just repairing her brain 24 hours a day. It's truly incredible. And you obviously mentioned at the start, and I found doing my research with you that you've done a, you've wrote a book on it. Is, is it Vivid Rain? Am I saying the right title? Yes. yes. Yeah. What, what was the, what was that process like writing about something that is so, that's kind of like what's in front of your face. You watched it all develop. Yeah, I was just, uh, a lot of it was we stayed, we lived at home for so long that, uh, or we couldn't go out because of, the, because of her seizures. And uh, so I just started writing notes down. And uh, I mean, a lot of it revolved around thinking that my daughter wasn't going to survive. And so just trying to remember those memories. And then thankfully she, she did. And we're, you know, right back to being a, the family that we were prior to epilepsy, but, and then looking around that I never really got as a parent, um, or as a human being, empathy from other, you know, doctors, nurses, family members, my work, you know, people at your office, at my office, didn't care that I was going through all of this. So that was a big thing. And then I wanted my daughter to have something. She hasn't read it, but when she gets older, I would like her to read it. But uh, just to have, just to know what she went through, because a lot of it wiped away her memory. You know, she doesn't remember a lot because of her seizures. Yeah, it's scary. Um, or I can imagine reading. Oh, I can imagine writing it. It did probably. It probably did <clears throat> touch you quite deep. But as you're writing about something of that kind of experience, what is the writing process like? As a kind of thing where you're remembering past experiences through it, and you're writing down your memories, or are you kind of 
making mental notes as it's going along. It's just been a kind of a writing process of quite a few years that was never really put to paper. I always, my writing process is I'm just always carrying paper or pen around with me and writing down notes and then putting those in, a, you know, organizing them and kind of organizing them as stories. So with the way that I write is I'll put, kind of put a chapter together the way that I want to write it and then put them together kind of like a puzzle piece. Um, and the writing process is all about taking, it's all about editing. It's about taking stuff out and, you know, there might be a story that doesn't work and you take it out later, even though you really did, you know, you liked it and thought that it was going to work, but it just wouldn't work for the way it was. And then ultimately, I mean, when I did publish the book, the, the editor t took out so much. Uh, and that's another factor that you, you, you kind of got to uh, look at is sometimes there's other, you know, other factors to getting your book out there. I think that is something that people don't really understand about writers is, it, there's so many different versions because editors are constantly telling you things you need to take out and put in, and other people are getting in your ear about it. So, what 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 is like? Do what are those meetings with an editor or with someone from a publishing company like? Is it kind of like almost sink to your stomach a little bit whenever you, they tell you to take something out that you thought was really good and you spend time on? It, it does, but you just have to. I think that's one of the things about writing. You just have to learn to forget, you know, throw it away and forget about it. A lot of it, it's like uh, it, it's with improv. It's you told the story and you just get rid of the story. Uh, but I do see that a lot, especially I felt that way for starting out. Is that that's your story and that's your child, and uh, you want to keep everything in there. But um, you know, you kind of do have to rely on them because they're the, you know, they are the professional, and they also. They do help you because of the fact that they're, you know, editing through to see how the story works because a lot of times you're thinking that the story works in a certain way and sometimes it doesn't. Was being an author always a goal for you or was there something that happened that kind of made you think, no, I could, I could see some success in this field? It's always been a goal for me just because I have like massive agoraphobia, so I don't ever like to go anywhere. <laughs> and so the writing, I, I, uh, I could make no money off of writing and at least I know that I have the writing and that's kind of mentally that keeps me out of like a, a deep depression is, is at least I have the writing and that's going to take me to the next day. And I kind of have always looked at it that way is uh, just take it day by day. And, you know, I try to write it, you know, I try to get just something written every single day. And I really look at it like if I could write one page a day, then I have 365, you know, pages at the end of the year. Uh, but even, you know, that's, I think a lot of writers do know that it's a struggle just to put some, you know, a little bit down. But to me, that's the, to me, that's the fun part of it. You're creating the story and you're putting it together. That's, I, I, now I'm thinking, on it, I think there is loads of people that would probably benefit from just writing, but not even like kind of publishing anything. No, I know a lot of people in groups and stuff that I'm on that have like unlisted blogs and they just come home after work and for that, deload hour where most people will be t watching something on tv they just sit and write on a blog just general feelings and it never goes anywhere it doesn't no one ever really sees it but it's just it, it, it seems to have like almost like a common effect in them it's like they're kind of talking to a therapist but they're talking to themselves oh it's great it's great therapy and it's you know you kind of hear the cliche of uh you know oh just journal well really it's therapy because you're talking you're talking it out and you're getting out there and i think a lot of times especially with uh, anything that has to do with, um, you know, I get a lot of anxiety and you try to convey that to other people. They just don't, they, they, their thought process is I'm going to try to fix you. And you're really just trying to, you know, tell them your feelings or your emotions, especially in the, you know, my prior line of work, you weren't allowed to talk about your emotions. You were just t constantly told to, to shut up. So it's very isolating. Um, and a lot of workspaces are like that also where, you know, they just, they just want you to shut up and work harder. So, I think, right, you know, any type of writing, it, 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 I think it really is just, uh, you know, you're working on yourself uh, and it's it's good medicine. Mentioning your prior line of work, as you mentioned at the start, you were in law enforcement. It seems to be a very mixed batch of feelings right now about law enforcement, especially on the internet. How, like, what was your experience kind of with it? My experience was I would try to, like, I got into it, a lot of it was I wanted, you know, health insurance and a good paying job because I wasn't making any money in arts at the time. And, um, 
so I thought, oh, I can help people. That was a big idea. And then you kind of get into it and you realize nobody wants to help anybody else. And then when I would help people, I would get uh, punished for helping those people. Like I would, you know, I got written up for trying to help somebody uh, learn to read or learn mathematics or trying to help somebody, you know, uh, get some housing or a job or something like that. You're just scrutinized constantly. You have more problems with the people that you work with. Uh, than the criminals. And the reason for that is the training. The training is very one-sided. It's, you know, this tunnel vision of you go in there and you arrest that person at all costs. When what I liked about my job as a parole agent was you're not supposed to arrest at all costs. You're supposed to go in and work with them like a social worker and help them. Yes, you have a badge and a gun, but the idea gets very clouded because a lot of other people that you work with think that you're just supposed to arrest them and punish them. And this longevity of punishing people repeatedly needs to change, but that's not what's changing. Do you think that comes from the power behind having a badge and a gun? Oh, definitely. Uh, it gives you this unlimited uh, authority and, and an arrogance. And especially with parole, the main thing with parole is you, it was a warrant with searches. So you could go in anywhere, any house, any car, anything, you know, you're basically violating people's constitutional rights, but, but they're, because they're on parole, you can go in there and, you know, sh- search anything. And so the, that's why the police love to use parole because the police needed a warrant, but parole didn't. And then you had all these other agencies that weren't even aware of that because they were so used to, having to go and get, you know, get a warrant signed off by a judge and serve that warrant where parole never, parole just bypassed all that. So that it was unlimited amount of power. And that was, you know, went to a lot of people's heads. Yeah. It's, it's something, it's, it always gives me the chills when I write here, people who did work in law enforcement, because anyone I've ever asked about, they've all, they've said the same thing you said at the start. It's kind of like, you're not allowed to help anyone who's in that justice system. And that's so terrifying because it just it shows why there are so many repeat offenders because if you if they can't learn anything why they're in these kind of situations how how are they ever going to avoid coming back yeah i mean one of my big um goals was to document uh, anyone that i met that had epilepsy and i met so many that had epilepsy but they would hide it because it was just categorized as mental illness and so I would write that down and then my bosses would tell me, you can't write that down because you're not a doctor, you're not in the medical field. And they would just be lost in the system. And here's somebody that can't even function because their brain is broken. Uh, they don't even have the skills to go and fill out a form to get government assistance. And that's what I saw a lot was the ones that you know could, could do the most, they were the ones kind of conning the systems, but the ones that needed the help the most, they were just lost because I wasn't allowed – to physically take that person into like social services and fill out the form for them. They had to do it themselves, but they had so much, you know, they were, they were so mentally ill, they couldn't do any of that. And that's why we have so much, you know, large portion of our homeless that are in Los Angeles is because they were in prison or jails before and they let them all out. And now they're living on the street and there's no, nobody's really doing much to help them because in return they need to help themselves, but they don't have the capability to do that. We always mentioned that power, dynamic of having a badge and gun as you kind of climb up through the ranks does that power dynamic get worse and worse well for for my department it it got better because of the fact that there was a big divide between the lower level parole agents and the supervisors and the managers the more of the really the i think this happens a lot is once they um, promoted then they turned on the people below them because it's this ideology of if i go and get this person fired I'm going to look better and I'm going to get promoted. You know, like for example, my, my boss shot a guy in the chest and they promoted him and they glorified him. Yeah. And all the guy was doing, the guy was unarmed. The guy was just trying to go, he wanted help and housing and my crazy boss shot him and everybody praised my boss for this. And I was the, one of the very few people that were like, don't you think that there's a problem? And then I was ostracized for even bringing that up. And, you know, I was the monster for saying, how dare I bring that up? But that's what I, that was my experience was anytime I would ever try to bring up, Hey, isn't there a problem that I would just get attacked. And, you know, it's kind of like the, the online trolls when you bring up a, a subject, even though it's the truth, everybody comes and attacks you for it. Yeah. I, I, I do understand that obviously with opinions, you're going to get both sides of the sword, but is that not a little bit disgusting in a way that, that there is no like, there's no, like the hierarchy of ranking in law enforcement. It really does mean that if you're at the bottom level, you don't really have anything apart from a badge. 
Oh yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, a lot of it had to do, I always say that it's the Kruger Dunning effect. It's this, um, you know, very low kind of intelligence and people just kind of stumbled into that job. Um, you know, when I was talking to, I had an internship in college and then I was talking to recruiters and they were, everybody was giving me the wrong information, the wrong information. As you get people that are, they start to promote, they just distance themselves from everybody else. So they really don't like, for example, in when I worked in a prison, you know, you never see the warden, the warden doesn't come inside the prison. It's all administration. It's on the outside. So the higher that they get up and then they're, the more of their status is that the more that it goes to their head, because now they're looking down on everybody and you know, you try, you would try to explain, you know, like I tried to explain myself, I was written up one time for, you know, they said that you took the day off of uh, St. Patrick's day and, and you, you, you're not allowed to do that. And I said, but that's the regular day off. That's the day that you gave me. And they still wrote me up for it. And it's just like insanity <laughs> where you're trying to argue your case and you can't get anywhere just because they're blinded by their position and their authority. And they just, they simply just don't care. And yes, disgust is a, word, a great word to use because that's a large reason why I, you know, I, I looked at retiring because I was just so disgusted. I couldn't, you know, you literally could not do your job. Yeah. I, I almost then fizz at a point then that like, what, what is my job? Oh yeah. But because, uh, you know, I still think about, you know, the, the parole, nobody from my office will, Call to see how I'm doing. The parolees, the criminals, are the ones that have checked up on me to see how I'm doing. That's how dysfunctional it is. Um, but I still think, you know, I still think about, you know, there's a parolee that still calls me that had like heart heart transplant, and cardiac arrest, and and just such a nice person, but had this horrible life filled with drugs and domestic violence, and you know, battered down and beaten. And that was somebody that I tried desperately to try to get them like medical insurance right before I left. And like my boss was like, you know, adamantly just denying this person because of the fact that he believed that it's a criminal and you shouldn't help criminals. So, and that's my boss. So I can't do anything. And there's so much friction just trying to do your job, but the ego's gotten in the way of so many of these supervisors. But something that I always think about is even just a normal, like passing by life is just like, you never really know what brought someone to where they are now, you know, like these criminals, I, I understand fully and I do not support anything they do, but there's a level of humanity you have to have and you have to look and think like, like what, what were they, like, what was the exposure to the world they had? Like their only childhood could have been absolutely terrifying. Oh yeah. I would, you know, one of the things is when you're um, arrested, you know, you're put in jail and then they're sentenced and then you go to prison. Well, nobody comes back and looks at your file. So I would be interested in looking at their files when I could. And some of them, you know, it's like you would read their childhood and it was, you know, my mom would put gasoline around uh, my high chair and light it on fire and then threaten to kill me. And that's how I lived, you know, most of my childhood Jeez. or, you know, my dad put cigarette butts out on my head to wake me up. And it's just like so far from the, how I was raised, but the, a lot of these guys are institutionalized and so much abuse uh, and they're just used to it. And then that comes down to they don't trust anybody. So when you're trying to help them, they they don't they're not going to hear it at first because they don't trust anybody, especially law enforcement. Which is why, again, th that's what another thing that needs to change this whole uh, you know ideology of um, you know this kind of paramilitary with law enforcement. It's it's this ranking system, uh, and it's the good against the bad. And really, if you're trying to change. Uh, how people are thinking you would start from hey you know what's your what was your childhood like let's talk about that but in prison that's not what it is it's just housing and feeding you're not talking about how how'd you get here and let's try to change that they don't because they really don't care about any of that they say that they do but they don't do any of it to me that is the biggest problem with the justice system is it's not so much like it, i under the things they do at times are it's borderline insanity i don't understand where they even get the ideas to do half the things but it's that level of not wanting to help someone when some of these people's lives have been absolute hell and the only way that they're not going to repeat is if someone just shows a bit of interest on them even just as you said learning someone how to read i would say like i tell a criminal who's never really had any kind of help or love in life I, that could be the deciding factor that sets him on the straight and narrow again and it's just so amazing to me that people involved in the justice system can't sit down put their brains together and see these people are clearly damaged. Is there any way we can help them? Some, like I would through simple, simple things. 
Oh yeah. I just think that it's, uh, it's education. It's like when I went through, you know, I went through these extensive academies and the academies were, you know, I would raise my hand and, and say like, well, you know, what if, you know, what if I'm attacked by these criminals that you're talking about? And the response was go talk to a supervisor, you know, well, how am I supposed to talk to a supervisor when I'm getting attacked? Uh, so the academies weren't really teaching you anything. They're just, you know, forced to do that because of their, you know, regulations or their, you know, we were f- following a policy. So always following a policy that really never made any sense. So if you were to educate people and then you tell those people, hey, let's do it this way. Uh, yeah, there's going to be some grumbling in the beginning, but that's how you make change. They just, you know, all the all these uh, riots that we had uh, in uh, the United States, uh, none of the training changed. So none of the policing changed with, hey, uh, you know, I can tell you when you see on the news, there's a naked guy in the street with a sword. That guy is 100% mentally ill. The news never talks about that. The police never talk about that. Their remedy for that is just to kill the guy, yep. you know? And that that's a perfect example of there's a mentally ill person. We've identified that person. Uh, you know, you even have now where, you know, the news just laughs. And you hear the re- re- so-called reporters laughing at this naked guy in the street that needs, you know, help. But that's not the way that society looks at it. So education, laws that change the way that people are thinking, you know, just the basic needs where in the, you know, jails and prisons, if you've ever been in there, it's concrete and steel, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how about a little, how about a nicer place to live? Frightening. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's very scary. Were these kind of were these strong opinions you have on the system? Was that the reason for you to write your book? It, uh, the, I, I went in wanting to write a book because when I was in college, I would get a lot of, you know, I remember asking the, a couple of my professors had never worked. Most of them had never worked in law enforcement before they were professors. And then one guy had been on probation, but he didn't know about parole and parole really fascinated me because I was like, Oh, we could help people, but he didn't know anything about prison. And I had asked questions about like, you know, if you pass away, is there a graveyard there? He didn't know. So I was like, well, I, you know, I, I kind of like to work in a prison to see what it's like and then write a book about it. And so that's what I set out to do. And, but it was just like crazy story after crazy story where it was just <laughs> like, you know, you could write many books about it because it just never ended. And there was no, you know, it dumbed you down so much that you would just kind of, you, you became so dumbed down and then you couldn't talk to anybody about it also because nobody really would believe you that all this stuff was going on. Uh, and then they couldn't relate because, you know, I, as I started to, I kind of got stuck in there because they had a hiring freeze. And then I started to have a family and you're going to like these birthday parties for little kids. And none of these other parents understand like what you're, you know, well, I don't understand why they held you over for 20 hours because that's prison. That's what they do. You know, so nobody could like figure out like the dysfunction that you were in. So you just didn't talk about it. And you see that a lot in law enforcement is, and I meet these guys all the time that just shut down and it's like, they have no soul uh, yeah. because they just really feel like nobody understands them. So when it comes to writing about your time on law enforcement in a book, are you restricted in any way on what you can say? Because I can imagine that there would be some things that the place where you work wouldn't want to hear. Oh, yeah. And they would. That's why I made it fiction. Uh, so, I mean, all, uh, everything with prison is about being sued and everybody wants to attack everybody. And that's going back to, like I was saying, where you try to bring up what's, you know, hey, let's fix the problem. People just attack you. Um, and that's what my job was all about. Just how, how can we attack this person? And, you know, the kind of the whole idea is let's, you know, totally uh, demoralize this person until they're just a shell of themselves. You know, and that's the person that we want. So going through and writing the book, I knew that I would get in trouble for it. I just never talked about it and never said anything. It's, it's so crazy that, they do like they know these stories, but they don't want to let them out. And I do, I understand. Like, I think you made the smart decision going to fiction, so it kind of disguises it. But do you think somebody reading this book would, it would, or like maybe subconsciously make their opinion of the justice system worse because they don't expect these things to be actually happening? Yes. And that was something that I, I was fearful of. I mean, you know, one of the things that I fearful was that I was so truthful um, that, you know, things have changed, like what you can, you know, a lot has changed about how you can, things that you can say. And so there's a lot of derogatory verbiage in the book um, that probably, you know, doesn't translate too well with people now, but it's the way that people talked. And, you know, that's in prison, it's the core of like, you know, it's just 
men are animals and you're put into a cement box and it's like what do you expect is going to happen to somebody like you would see people deteriorate mentally because of the fact that they're just in a cement box and there's no like we take for granted our cell phones and you know tv radio whatever because that kind of makes us focus on other things but these guys don't have anything and you watch them mentally deteriorate it's hard to watch but it's also you know something that i think would make you know to show interesting in a book when i hear you know responses from people about the way that i wrote i'll get you know that that didn't they're convinced that that didn't happen or that's not true and i just think it's a knee-jerk reaction of uh you don't want to hear it because it is so weird and bizarre uh, and my response is well i you know i did i did my best <laughs> yeah it sounds like a movie storyline <laughs> yeah I, I mean you know people ask um you know, is prison like uh, TV shows or movies? Yeah, it is because anything goes in prison. It's a city in itself and everything is constantly going on, you know, all the time. And then it's, it's a different society. It's not, you know, it's like these, you know, you're stripping these guys out constantly. They're naked all the time. You know, Hey, where's somebody carry drugs or contraband? Well, it's, it's, you know, where else can they carry it when they have no clothes on? So <laughs> uh, it's just a very bizarre way in your life. But that's a lot of these guys, they're institutionalized and that's, it's, it's a norm for them. And so to try to explain that to other people, they just don't want to hear it. You know, it's like, what do you, when there's no women in the prison, you know, what else are you going to do? You know, what else are you going to do? You're going to make, you're going to make relationships with other men because that's prison. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense, but common sense isn't very common nowadays unfortunately so we'll fast forward now to where you are now you mentioned you're a full-time actor and producer now yeah so i i you know i when i was younger i got into acting but uh there was no internet and so i couldn't i, I really had you had to physically drive there you had to audition uh and then I, I had a lot of arrogance when i was younger like i i got roles that I didn't show up for um and then it really hurt um when i wouldn't get the part and i really and Law enforcement is all about, you're not allowed to fail at anything. Um, and acting is all about failure. And anything with, anything with arts is about failure. And so it's such, it is so, uh, it's such a nice way to live now is constantly embracing that failure, embracing that silence and darkness. Um, and so in the last year, I've been doing a lot of acting. Uh, and, you know, like one of the, yesterday I was on a set. Uh, it was a great role and the director hugged me at the end. That would never happen in my other job. Nobody would, nobody would ever show you any of that sort of motion. So I love it. And I, you know, very grateful that I can do it and, uh, and I'm going to continue to do it. And all I'm looking forward in that is just to be a working actor. What was the transition of that? Like, because it's so, uh, that's like such polar opposites that you could like, if you turn around an actor and say, what would the, what was your job before? And he said he worked in law enforcement. Like you'd almost turn around and make that into a movie. Yeah, I, it, it was for, you know, it was 100% for me because I was always, you know, I always feared one of the things working in a prison, I always feared prison. So I said, if I can work in a prison, I can go do acting or I can do stand up comedy because standing up on stage horrifies, still does horrify me, uh, you know, getting, trying to remember lines, you know, a lot with acting when you show up on set is a lot of it's improv. So they're throwing you lines and that's very nerve wracking for me and gives me a lot of anxiety, but that's what I'm trying to work on is getting through through that and getting a little more comfortable and you know like yesterday was a great I, I didn't want you know in the beginning i don't want to go you know, the idea of trying to find the set and get there on time and it was rain you know it was raining you know i got up at six and left and uh, but then when i got there and get more comfortable and you meet everybody uh you're kind of working through that my anxiety um and it turned out to be great and, and i've always heard all these horror stories but law enforcement was far worse i will take any set acting set any day I checked out your IMDb before I started the light, uh, space, and I was almost took back with some of the things you were in. You've been on, like you've been acted in some incredibly massive movies. Yeah, and if anybody is trying to, you know, get into acting, the number one thing that I see is people just don't do it. You know, if you if you want to go, I mean, it's so. What's so great now is everything's on your phone. You can shoot your you can shoot your own movie. You can write and direct it and produce your own movie. You know, you can have crowdfunding. None of that existed when I was younger. Um, and so that's what I tell people is go make your own movie. You know, bypass everything. You now's the opportunity now you have the time, you know, the opportunity to do it. Now's the time. Um, and those were 
all things that I wanted to do, you know, going back to like my first, I think the first one that I did was like the doors where I had to drive to like the middle of some, you know, somewhere there was a, a, a folding table there in the middle of nowhere. And I signed up for it. I mean, I'm really surprised at how I, how I went and got that. That was just extra work, but it's so much easier now because they'll send you all of that work now, you know, through all these different casting websites. You've been involved with the great Gatsby and catch me if you can, which are obviously hugely in order to cap room movies. I, how, what, what, what is it like on those movies? Cause whenever you watch them, you just look at them and kind of like, and in, in all, like you just look and think, I can't believe there's minds out there that just created this from nothing. Is it kind of walking around those sets and seeing the work unfold? Do you just kind of sit back and think, like, this is just, like, I'm watching greatness? Oh, yeah, it's very surreal. I, I, you know, yesterday, it was in 1962, I was playing a character that was admitting my wife into a hospital, uh, and the whole set was from 1962. It was awesome. Uh, and that was the coolest thing for me. You're kind of sitting there in a time capsule. Um, and... Uh, I, I love every minute of it there. I mean, there's, you know, down, there's a lot of downtime. It's like you wait a long time to, once you get there, you wait a long time to actually get onto the set. So it is there, you know, there's 12, 16 hour days. Uh, but so far I'm enjoying it a lot better than I did when I was younger. What was your experience like an album of the chipmunks? Cause that's so bizarre to me. <laughs> it's bizarre for me too. I don't think I was in that one. Were you not? It's I, don't lusted, think, I don't think it's so. lusted in your IMDb, so someone's lying to me. Well, I think <laughs> that there's like I think there's like six Mike Knoxes, so uh, and I know there's another one that was like in a pretty famous horror movie. So um, you may have been taken over as them as every Mike Knox then. I'll have to check. You know what? I haven't I haven't updated it in a long time, so I'll have to go back and, and look through it. You know, um, there's me spreading false. I can't wait for a drama no, channel to pick me up. I, I hope that I was in it. <laughs> <laughs> That you mentioned, obviously, in acting, the big, the, the whole, I wouldn't say the whole responsibility you have there, but something you have to face more than any other profession is failure. And as an actor, be it, I kind of being told no as an actor, it must just like shit your confidence through the floor, like I can imagine. But how, how do you deal with it so? It sounds bad saying how do you deal with failure so often, but it is the reality of acting. You, you just don't know. And I just feel fortunate that now people are kind of talk, you know, actors are kind of talking about like the things that they went through. And really, it, you know, uh, I think it was Michael Keaton that said, uh, the, you know, if you look at it like the um, <clears throat> the audition is also the job that's also going to help. And I think that that's so great mentally. If you just go in and you you read your lines or you you do your audition and then you leave and you don't hold on to it, you're going to be fine. And you really don't ever know. You know, I've had three jobs uh where I've signed a contract for it and gotten a date, you know, gotten booked for it and gotten a date to, to um, show up for the set. And then they've emailed me and said, you know, Hey, the director doesn't like you. He's going with somebody else. Okay. Well then you move on to the next one. Yeah. It stings a little, but the more that you keep doing it over and over the repetitive, you get kind of forget about it. Um, But that's just the nature of the job. So it is very hard. Um, You know, I had a, I did a, uh, a TV show where the, uh, I asked one of the producers, how come you guys hired me? And the guy said, uh, Oh, cause you look so old. So you never know why <laughs> you never know why you got something or didn't get something. A lot of it, you could have done the best performance of your life. And it just came down to, you know, that was, you know, they wanted to go with somebody else. Um, it, it's like, it's a sport. I mean, it really is. You, you, you just have to kind of, you know, be prepared. And if it works out, it works out. I saw such a funny interview some years ago i cannot even remember who it was but it was a director talking to a cast member on a movie and they just turned around and were like oh like what was your reason for hiring me and he just turned around and said you were the only white person that auditioned yeah i mean it, it's it's anything it's amazing uh, because these directors are really looking for specifics and if they don't get them they just won't hire the person <laughs> Yeah, you know, and and also sometimes, you know, you can look at the description of what they want and stuff changes all the time. I mean, y- yesterday was a perfect example. They changed three or four different scenes and then they throw you the line. Hey, this is what I want you to say. Um, so everything is constantly changing. Uh, I think that's a hard part for somebody like me that doesn't like change. But there are – you just adapt to it and you overcome. But that was a large reason why I wanted to do it because I, I wanted to face my fears. I don't want to be uh, – you know, as I get – Ra- uh, you know, rapidly older. Um, I don't want to look back and have regret of, 
you know, and I, and I hear that from other people all the time. You know, you, we're such a negative uh, world, Every, you know, everybody kind of says, you know, things against you. I would, I would much rather s- at least be able to say, you know, at least I tried. What's that feeling like of watching yourself on screen? Because I would imagine it's very surreal and kind of weird. Uh, for me, it's very weird. And um, it, again, it just takes time to go over it. And, you know, sometimes I just don't. If you feel like you didn't, you know, like a good example is I, I did a commercial last week and I did I felt horrible about it because it was just like heavy dialogue and I didn't feel like I read it right. And But they were happy with it. And I was like, well, I don't want to, you know, and they were showing, you know, you're watching the reel of it and, you know, I look, you know, like I'm bloated uh, and I look like I'm dying. Uh, and so I'm like, well, I'm never going to watch this again. So sometimes <laughs> you look good. Sometimes you look good, you know, especially like headshots. Um, I always think I look horrible in headshots, but then, you know, the agent will tell you, this is the one that I want. You're like, but that's the most disgusting one that I have. That's just the <laughs> way that it is. You really do look different. Um, uh, you know, on TV than in person, it kind of seems like our faces change all the time. Um, you know, sometimes you know, I went to, uh, I had, had a reunion with people that I, I think they were, in, yeah, it was eighth grade. I did not recognize two of them, but the rest of them you kind of recognize. So our, our faces are kind of always changing. Yeah, I, I definitely relate to that. I know a lot of people that I went to school with and if I walk by them, I, I generally don't know if I'd recognize someone. Uh, yeah, and I never thought that would be the case, but here I am. I, you know, I never thought that I'd be this old either, and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, what kind, what like well-known kind of successful actors have you worked with, or actresses, I should say as well? Well, yesterday, <clears throat> I worked with Richie Stevens, who's this Irish gangster guy, um, and that was pretty cool. And uh, he wrote he wrote a book. I can't remember the book that it was called, but I had actually gone to his. Uh, uh, book reading a few years ago and I got there on set yesterday and there he was and I that guy was I was like wow that's so cool what's that moment like meeting with him because it must be weird seeing someone who is kind of a role model for you to to me it's fun but at the same time I, I just think it uh it, it's who you are it's like you could go to um you know, you could go to like America, uh, America's Got Talent and you could see all of the people on the panel. There's people in the audience that came there just to see those people. Or did you, you know, did you come to see the celebrities like Simon or did you come to just watch the show? So it's some people show up just to, cause they're enamored by the stars. I think a lot of it is because I grew up in Los Angeles. So you see them a lot, but then again, um, you know, they're, I don't know them. They're not my friends. So I just try to leave them alone. Cause I also think that it's kind of weird that, you know, you'd have all these people following you around all the time. I think in the beginning it could be nice, um, but I certainly don't think they want to talk to me. So I don't, I don't really kind of get enamored by stars, uh, but it is definitely surreal because you've seen that person on TV or you've seen them in the movie, so you feel like you know them. It seems at the moment the kind of people coming out of the woodwork about st- like bad experiences and weird experiences they've had on set and with directors and things. Have you ever experienced anything that kind of made you look back and think, do I really want to do this movie or do I really want to be on this TV show? Like something that kind of turns your stomach a little. No, but I also think that it just depends on uh, what set that you are. I can definitely see how all of that can happen. Um, and especially, you know, like in comedy, um, you know, there's some com- um, uh, teachers that want to focus on, on kids. And I don't, you know, I don't want to do comedy when I'm in a show with kids. I want to come to me. Comedy is about adults. So, so same with TV shows. I don't, I don't want to do a TV show that has kids around. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, attracts all of these kind of, it's the same thing with law enforcement. It's like, you're kind of attracting these types of people. Uh, so I haven't seen anything, but all the shows I've done have been adult shows. Uh, and what I've seen is that everybody comes to work, they've got a job to do, they want to get that job done. You know, they want to see the, that uh, film or show uh, completed. So everybody's working together to do it. And I think that, uh, you know, a lot of times you're, there's so much freedom on the set. So I can definitely see how all of that happens. But thankfully, I haven't seen any. I've the one kind of thing that I saw was an actor coming, you know, late to set, not showing up, doing his job, and then them kicking him off because he was trying to tell the director what to do. Yeah, kind of a power, hung- power hunger type thing. Yeah, you do see that. And I think that the difference is, are you 
you, are you coming as an actor to work or do you think you're going to become famous? Cause I see that also with stand up comedy. If you, you know, I don't want to be famous. I just want to work. And again, that's your ego. You know, you're challenging your ego thinking that to me, the, that fame is very quickly. Yeah. People don't understand that. It's a massive bubble. It can be, bu- it can burst any second really. And you could be just gone. Definitely. So obviously you're mentioned a few times and I wrote on the original post that you are a stand-up comedian, which seems now that everybody wants to be one, but obviously they're not as good as the ones that make a living off it. But how did you get into stand-up comedy? Because I'd imagine you started at a time where it probably wasn't as popular as it is now. <coughs> the first time I did stand-up was in Santa Barbara. And it was in front of a large group of people and I killed. And then I opened up for a band and I didn't kill because you're not supposed to combine comedy with music. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how that matches. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't at all. But I didn't, I had, you know, I didn't have Google. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't figure stuff out. Uh, so I think with comedy, it just, it's longevity. I see a lot of people that just quit comedy because it's hard. It's late nights. You know, you're waiting all night long to get, you know, in the beginning, it's five minutes, and you're not getting paid to do any of it. I've made more money off of acting than I have comedy. Uh, uh, to me, it's just one of the tools in the toolbox. If you can, you, you know, you're writing, you're writing comedy, and then you're going to see, you know, you're going to, you're going to be networking. So somebody's going to, you're going to meet somebody, and they're going to say, oh, I want to, you know, I, I want to use your, you know, your writing or your comedy, or I think that you're funny. Uh, so to me, the comedy is just. Um, you know, you're, to me, I'm working on myself when I'm up there because you're working out jokes. And if you focus on that and you don't focus on, oh, somebody's going to come and find me or, you know, I'm going to become a celebrity. It's going to be a lot easier. Uh, I just see, you know, I think there's two guys that kind of made it uh, that I started out doing open mics with and the rest of them just disappeared. That's so common in every kind of successful comedian that talks about their journey that they start, the people they started off with are not just kind of non-existent anymore. And do you think that has to do with kind of, I don't think people understand that, you know, the way an athlete works on his skills, a comedian has to kind of almost live in like comedy stores to kind of hone in their skills and get better. I think that is the reason why people fall off it because it's just so much focus that you need to really put into it. Oh yeah, because it's it kind of goes in different segments. It's you know you get excited in the beginning because you got you finally got up on stage and then people were laughing, so your jokes were working, uh, and then you know you're then you're going out a lot, and sometimes you're you know you're completely bombing. It, it really is like it depends on where you're going. Sometimes you'll go, you know, I went to a, I did comedy in a bowling alley one time, and it was just me and the bartender, and he wasn't laughing. So <laughs> it's really this, you know, ups and downs and it gets very frustrating because you're kind of riding this high that it's working and then it's not working and then it is working. Um, so you just kind of got to go into it and you, you go up, you do your set and you forget about it. You know, you make notes to if it, stuff works or not, but you, you know, you could go and have a, you know, go do a very popular show and completely bomb. And I've seen that for very professional where they just get up there and for some reason they just blanked out. Uh, and that's just kind of part of the game. What's that feeling like when you come onto the stage and your sole purpose is to entertain, to make people laugh, the people watching, they've bought their came there to be entertained, to laugh. What's that like when you say a joke and it's just, it's like you could hear a pun drop, just there's no noise or there could be booze what's that feeling like it's uh i mean it's horrifying but you just have to embrace uh, i really think you got to just embrace the darkness if you can just stand up there in dead silence and feel comfortable i think that's funny you know i think i just saw a comedian last week his whole kind of bit was just a lot of it was just being very very silent and talking very slowly uh And, you know, that's your job as the comedian is to kind of control the audience. And they, the audience came there to laugh anyways. They, they know mentally why they're there. So for the most part, um, they're there to have fun. You know, once in a while you'll get somebody that drank too much or something like that. But most of the time, everybody knows, you know, what they're supposed to be doing. 
I watched a special that someone released on Instagram recently. I don't think they had many followers. I think we only had a thousand followers or something, but the video completely blew up because he advertised his show as please come and hate on me. And loads of people just came on, people that just had a terrible day, they've had a horrible week, they've just got really shit news on the phone and they just want to come and just abuse someone for an hour. And he sat there and every time they said something, he just absolutely tore them to pieces. And he he wrote on, he shows his poster and he zooms in and it just says, beware, I will talk back. And I think that's something that in stand-up comedy has become more like popular now is that kind of crowd work that you don't you don't just need to stand there and say dad jokes for an hour. You can talk to someone, you can pick people out and you can make jokes based on what's around you. Yeah, and I think that... Um... I think it kind of stopped for a little bit because people were too afraid to say something. So it's kind of back, but the I mean, crowd work is a staple of like every show. They always, like, always got a comedian out front uh, on a TV show, you know, that's uh, when they're taping it to get the crowd going. Um, so same with comedy. It's like, you're, you know, you're, it's some people don't want to, you know, I'm not the type of comedian that likes to talk to the crowd, but I think it's, it works great because the, then the crowd connects better with you. Uh, and they're there, to, you know, they are there to have a good time. Uh, and I think it makes the best comedy when you're talking to the, to the crowd. What's the process of writing jokes like? Because I can't, I, I can't kind of, I kind of can't piece together thoughts of how it would look. I, I wouldn't know how, where to start if someone told me to prepare for a comedy show. It's, it's really like just kind of a three part, you know, you're, you want to, you want to write the joke down, but then see how else you can layer on to that joke. And see how else can I make this funny? And so keep writing different variations of it and then, you know, see how it works. Um, and then also your, how are you, are you saying the joke fast? Are you saying it slow? Are you waiting for, you know, there's always the great thing about comedy is always the callback, you know, when you, when you can somehow call back to your very first joke at the end or the middle, that's always, that's pure comedy gold right there. Uh, but a lot of it with comedy is just writing down an idea, then saying that to your friends, you get a laugh from your friends, write that down. Did it work? You know? That's actually true. I never thought on that. Um, whenever you're going through kind of like normal life, like day to day, are you if you see something that could be entertaining or you could turn into a joke, are you noting it down like you said you would do when you're writing? You just kind of take notes? Yes. And, and I think a lot of comedians are like that. You're always looking for the next material. Because one of the you know downsides of comedy is once you kind of put that stuff out there, especially online, you've got to come up with new stuff. And then you're constantly talking to people, hey, do you have new material? <laughs> And then kind of one of the traps that I had was, you know, you would kind of, you know, kind of meet some snarky people that, you know, they'll put down your, you know, don't you have anything besides dad's dad jokes? And you're like, but I worked so hard on this. And then you're trying to get new jokes when <clears throat> you really should have uh, just stuck with your dad jokes because that works the best for you. And that's what you got to do is you just got to figure out what works for you. You know, like for me, I'm an older person up on stage. Um so I'm going to talk about family and the funny things about family. It might not resonate, but usually it does. I mean, usually everybody, even though they might not have kids, it's still people get those, you know, they know that it's funny. And that's the great thing about, you know, comedy is it's really my vulnerability. And then I'm telling other, you know, I'm talking about the horrors of like, say epilepsy. I'm not making fun of epilepsy. I'm just saying how much it's, you know, sucks. Like, you know, when I, you know, somebody tells me, somebody refers me to like my pastor, uh, his pastor at uh, his church. And I say, Hey, could you pray for my daughter for epilepsy? And then pastor Mark says, we don't do that here. Yeah. Like, so, really? You don't pray for people? Uh, that's I thought my head wrote down was like, kind of, as you mentioned, you know, you're like, you're, you're older. So people would maybe, they maybe kind of, they don't really expect the whole comedy. Like, performance to be about dad jokes but if you throw them on every now and again they're not going to be like why is he saying dad jokes they'll be like oh it makes sense with how you know what we're looking at how we're seeing him does that kind of have a big effect in comedy kind of people not playing into the perception the audience is going to have of them because the best example i can have of is brandon Schaub, is an ex-ufc fighter turned comedian and anyone that turns up to a comedy show and sees him he's an absolute animal of a man they're not going to want them putting on silly voices and making wee girly jokes. They're going to want them to make a joke about something like intense, something that's going to make them really go like, shit, he can say that because look at him. Yeah. And you, and you as a comedian, that's just up to you to, you know, it's like if um, I show up wearing a suit and I'm at a comedy show, 
well, then people are expecting me to, you know, make some sort of reference of why I'm in that suit. So any kind of aspect of how you, you know, people, that's what people are doing. They were kind of breaking you down any way that you, you know, it's like I have gray hair. So I make a joke about my gray hair and that kind of puts the audience at ease about it. Um, and that's your job as the comedian to, to figure that out, figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, but to me, most of the time the audience is forgiving. It's usually just, you know, it's, it's me obsessing about certain things that are, are not relevant to anything. Nobody, re- you know, and people came for comedy. They really didn't care the age that I am. Yeah. There is a genius behind that kind of design in your comedy style to fit how you look, because I remember seeing an interview with Matt Reif and they were talking about how did he find his, he's got this and like incredibly popular act of, of red flags and relationships. And he mentioned it was because his following is just, it's 90% women and women don't really want to go to comedy shows by themselves. So he wanted to find a way he could bring relationships on it. So they'd find something relatable and it's not like they're going to sit there and go, what does this guy know about relationships? He's, they obviously think he's very good looking, so they're going to think he has a lot of them. And that's kind of how he designed his act. And I always think that these comedians that can do that, it's just, it's a, le- it's a level of understanding about yourself, but it's also, there's a level of genius there hidden. Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a, you know, I, I uh, the first time that I saw uh, Burt Kreischer, he took his shirt off. and Incredible show. And I, and, this was, you know, 2006 probably. And I just thought to myself, my God, this guy's going to, this guy's going to be famous because that's, his, <laughs> that's his, this guy could, if he could take, I would never take my shirt off. Are you kidding me? I'm so uncomfortable uh, looking at myself in the mirror. This guy took his shirt off up on stage. This is amazing. And that it was such a unique, um, uh, brand that he had, uh, that, it, that blew my mind. This guy's getting up on stage, he's taking his shirt off, and he's doing his comedy. And that's what it is. It's he, at all costs, was doing whatever he could uh, to further his comedy career. Yeah, something like that thing that Bert does. It must be for like an audience member, and maybe as a hater, is maybe just sitting there like, oh, I can't wait to show something at home. And then he does it, comes out, starts drinking alcohol, pulls his shirt off, starts screaming, and they're just sitting there like, right, well, I can no longer hate on him. I may as well maybe sit and enjoy yeah, I mean that's something that <coughs> excuse me is uh definitely worked for him and and nobody else, you know nobody he's cornered that market nobody else can do that you know you if you were to take if I was to take my shirt off everybody would be like you're being like him so uh, that's your job as a comedian is to find out what works and and what doesn't and I think that is hard as a comedian also when you know everybody is looking for a way to put you down so you really do have to fight through all the negativity like you know when you you know, post a, a, a silly video, which you kind of have to do now because all these, you know, you know, a lot of casting wants to know what your following is. Uh, so you're kind of forced to do that stuff, but it is hard to put that, put yourself out there and, um, you know, but then you see, does the audience respond to it or not? And usually they will because that's your job to do that, but sometimes it doesn't. So it is a gamble for you to take. You're making the transition onto these topics so easy because my next thing I was going to ask about was kind of the role of social media now in stand-up comedy because I know I know there's a lot of huge comedians now that they kind of gain their following and gain that consistent ticket sale because some of their clips just go incredibly viral. Is that kind of something that you need to plan into now your comedy act? Now it's not just about the comedy not just about what you're doing on stage it's about right how can i I, can this be pushed out onto the internet to the people that aren't here i just everybody's on their phone and everybody uses that for a source of communication so uh, i just think it's wise to to use that to your advantage it's like uh you know i uh a guy that I know, Michael Jammon, was a TV writer, is a TV writer, and he wrote, wrote a book. Well, before that, he was marketing himself every single day, doing lives. And, uh, you know, you would think, well, why do you want to do that? And it's like, well, he's trying to sell a book. Um, and he did that for two years, you know, doing lives, multiple lives every single day on TikTok and Instagram and building that following. Um, and he did that all himself. And I see that a lot also with comedians is that um, they're not waiting for other people to discover them. They're going out there and they're getting their own production and they're making their own shows. And there's so many great ones on YouTube. I did one um, where I pretended to be a cop. Uh, I can't remember the name of the show, 
but it was five comedians and it was just hilarious. And it was just, you know, in a, in an inexpensive studio and they've got millions of followers. Um, and you would never know unless you were, you know, aware of them and, you know, the comedy world, but that's kind of where we are with all the technology is you could have millions of followers and still not have that fame, but you're making tons of money. Yeah, it's it's interesting seeing it because it's, it's becoming more and more popular that that is the route comedians are trying to take. It's almost like that, almost like that Andrew Schultz model of whenever like I was growing up, I always kind of was I always kind of watched comedy and always like knew who the, the big standout comedians were, and it was always kind of you needed to kind of be chased by like a big brand to really gain that exposure. But now it's almost like something like Andrew Schultz who does all his specials and stuff and just releases them on his own platforms and doesn't have anyone involved on it, just uses his own crew. It seems to be more and more popular. Like I'm starting to see that not people are moving away from platforms like you no know, Netflix and Amazon Prime and things like HBO, but there it's kinda like why do I want to put why do I want to have you as kind of my successor when I could build my own following? And then do it all myself, and then people will like that authenticity more. Yeah, it's just everything has shifted. You know, it's it's not um, these HBO specials of comedy that you used to see, and everybody would watch the same thing. It's way across the board. You know, you have hundreds of different choices, if not thousands, to choose from. And you know, it's like people are constantly telling me, "Have you seen this certain show on or comedy special?" No, I didn't even know that it was on. Now you've got to go search for it, and then you realize this huge following. So. I, to me, it's pretty cool because it's kind of the start of the next generation of comedy and, you know, where is everything headed to? It's kind of like, you know, I used to always read a newspaper. <laughs> it's like unheard yeah. of. You know, <laughs> my, my dad was mad because I'm not reading the LA Times. I don't think anybody's reading the LA Times. Uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't come to your house anymore. So Mine always asks me, did I get the newspaper? And I, I don't even know where sales are. <laughs> right. I don't either. And so to me, it's fascinating just where I always like the where it's going. I love the history also of of communication and how we communicate. Uh, and I've always embraced it. And I think, I mean, this was my dream to have everything literally on my phone. Yeah. Um, so I love it. I could, I could not possibly live without my phone. What's it like doing improv as a comedian? Cause I imagine that there's probably one of, it's probably, it's probably one of like kind of your gyms to enhance your skills is going and not having a scrub, not having jokes made and just throwing stuff out there and seeing what kind of hits, what some, what people react to better yeah improv is the great to me it's the greatest skill you can have as an actor because you're just you're getting the you're making the story you're making the character you're throwing and you're throwing everything away afterwards and you're not even thinking about it i was always afraid of improv so i'm i've just gotten into it and uh i'm still i don't enjoy it um but um i can imagine i, I think it is one of the greatest skills and i wish that i had done it a long time ago but again I'll, these are all the things that i was mentally afraid of yeah i i come thinking of what it would be like going on to that with no practice at all. Like it would almost be like me coming into the podcast with like no research done and just hoping that I can piece together a podcast. It, be, it is it's terrifying to think about that because preparation is what everybody kind of wants now and they want it laid out in front of them. So something like improv, I'm, I'd imagine that it completely takes a lot of pressure off you as a comedian whenever you go to a show that is planned. Yeah, I'm just seeing, to me, to, to learn like, oh, to to learn actually how everything works and you, and you kind of see how a lot of these actors are taken out of these improv troops you know certain and you just never knew it but they were just constantly always doing it it all goes back to improv um and i just kind of never really realized that that's where everybody was getting their you know training from same with clowning clowning is great also because clowning is all about being present um it's silence you're using your emotions to convey that to the audience. I mean, that was something that I just kind of never even thought about before. Uh, and those kind of go hand in hand in and clowning. I had the same opinion whenever I watched an interview with Kevin Hart and he mentioned going to an open mic with Chris Rock. And I couldn't get my head around the fact that these two guys are so successful in so many different fields are going to an open mic night, which someone who's only done maybe three comedy shows is at. And then they mentioned Dave Chappelle walking and and going up two or three times just because he's got different jokes coming into his head and he wants to see what works. And if someone doesn't like it, they just turn around and they go, what was wrong with it? And he'd ask for feedback while they stand there. And it was just so amazing to me. But it makes sense because how else would you 
learn because you can't really come to your like a show that's planned and people that are coming to see you with material you that realistically you have zero idea if it's going to work yeah and it's great for those guys because they're in a position of everybody can identify it's like jerry seinfeld going up he can say whatever he wants you're going to laugh at it Um, yeah because i you know i certainly would um and so it's a they're in a great position to do that like if i were to go and do that nobody would care Uh, (laughs) so but that's what open mics are it's a place for you to work out stuff and you do have i mean it's not like there are people you know you know, waiting to discover you, but there are people that are constantly, there are agents and managers that are, that are going to these shows and they are looking for people. Cause you, again, it's like a sport. You can see somebody that, Oh my gosh, this person is, has a great presence. They're going to go far. You know, that's somebody that I can work with because a lot of times you're going to see a lot of horrible comedians that are just going to, you know, fall off and you'll never see them ever again, but there, you will be able to find somebody that I can hear you now. Sorry about that. It's my fault. That's no problem. No problem. It happens before. This is my first time on uh, Twitter X. Yeah, it's different. No, I like it. <laughs> it's nice, yeah, but a lot of people have had that kind of same issue where it kind of like their mics kind of cut out. I honestly don't know what it's for. I haven't, I haven't went to the ball or finding out. To be honest, probably should, but it happens. It happens. No problem. I've made a note anyway, so I can edit it out. But yeah, we, uh, got, we got pretty far. It was good. Yeah, it was good. Something that I, whenever you were away, that came to my head was. Comedians seem to be coming up a lot now in a- as actors, and they seem to be getting roles in movies that maybe, but maybe are sitcoms, or they need that little sitcomy vibe to certain parts of it. What is it about stand-up comedy that seems to translate over to acting? Well, a lot of it is the writing. So if you can, if you can get a comedian, because obviously the comedian is writing their own jokes. So then, you know, if you can put a show together. Um, you know, like I have a half hour comedy about um, prison guards and then I, you know, I could write a million stories about prison and how funny prison is. And so that's kind of you're already packaging up yourself um, to sell the idea for it or to pitch it. And so the fact that, you know, the, the comedians can write, then they can write their own show. And that's something that can sell. And that's something that could make, you know, possibly make some people some money. Yeah. What's what's. uh I'd like being on the road, so to speak, in comedy, because I think that's something people overlook. Well, that's where you make all your money is in the road. I've never, I've never done that because of my, I can't go anywhere because of my daughter. Um, it's a place that I tend to go to in a, about two years. Uh, Cause kind of like cruise ships also. Um, the hard part is you're just away from home. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't like to travel. There are people that like to travel, but I think it's the romanticizing about traveling and being away from home. Um, but that's not something that I want to do, but that's where you're, you know, you see all these comedians, you know, they'll, you know, go do shows and, um, then they'll, they're, maybe they're doing a TV show or a movie, but then they're also, um, going to do a tour and, uh, oh, you know, more. yeah, they're working comedians. So, you know, I know a few comedians that they're constantly on the road. Um, they don't necessarily want to be on the road, but that's where they're making their living. Suppose if you were a comedian, you were, you know, you don't have any thing to tie you back. You don't like you're single and you don't have any, you don't like kind of have a house or anything like that. Suppose it would make sense to be on the road while you can. Yeah. I mean, some of the, some of the best advice that I ever got um, was from Erica Rhodes. And she said, you know, I have a small place to live, um, but this is what I want to do. Um, I'm not making, you know, millions of dollars, but I make enough to survive because this is what I want to do. And a lot of people don't want to do that. They don't want to sacrifice. And that's what you've got to do with any job is you've got to sacrifice, uh, especially with comedy, you've got to sacrifice financially, but it can be done, you know? Yeah. You obviously you mentioned that you can't because you, we always already discussed uh, your daughter's condition as you're in Hollywood. What what's the comedy scene like in Hollywood? Because I would imagine in Hollywood, they maybe don't want to laugh as much as they don't want to laugh as much because they want to look good. If you know what I mean. Oh yeah, I, I think that there's you know you get a different sense for different. Like I like going to the Ice House because you have families that are in the area geographically, whereas in Hollywood, everybody kind of thinks that they're famous. Uh, so different comedy clubs in Hollywood, it's harder to get a laugh or it's harder to warm them up. Um, but that's just your job. It's you work in places that are, you know, the crowds are just different. 
lately though the comedy has been popping up everywhere i mean there's a, a comedian jay davis that runs two shows um i mean he and and that's one of the things about comedy if you you know if you're not kind of succeeding in certain ways run your own show run your own mic um you can do it forever um and he's somebody that runs a great show and i mean you know i uh went to one of the places that was in a restaurant it was great you know great food and great staff and everything just kind of worked together to do comedy so there's so many different places now that have opened up i think a lot of it is also because of post-covid where people want to get out um where they didn't want to do that before i really saw you know around 2000 and where everything was online and, and it really looked like comedy was going to die. Uh, but now I think with, when people were forced to be inside, now people want to go out and especially they want to laugh and they want to, you know, every, the dynamics of everything's changed. People want to go out. They want to, you know, they want to be entertained. So I think it's a great time for comedy. That is kind of the general description of people that I think go to comedy shows. They do want to go out and they want to be entertained and they want to laugh. So during COVID, what was comedy like? Because you couldn't do that. It was horrible because I was doing comedy online and <laughs> I, I hated it. Oh. <laughs> um, and they do they were doing, the, I mean, they were doing the best that they could, but, uh, or I would do, you know, comedy. I did comedy in a, it was a huge home. It was a big mansion, but we had to wear masks like in between in the backyard of this house. So it was just kind of ridiculous. Um, but you kind of just did what you could do. A lot of comedians that I knew, moved out of LA because they didn't have a job anymore. So it was devastating for anybody in comedy. Yeah. I think that is probably where the, the spike in social media importance for a comedian came from. Because I remember even early times of COVID and it was really, really strict. Comedians were putting up promos and marketing like they would for a TikTok live comedy show. And that must have been the most barbaric thing for a comedian telling jokes to your phone and you actually don't know if the people are laughing or not. Yeah. And it was, for me, it was like, you would get a laugh, but it would be delayed. You're kind of not getting the, the, the satisfaction out of it. You see but, ha 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 in the chat. It, yeah. But it, um, you know, it opened up a lot to me. It also opened up a lot of avenues for, you know, people putting out their own material, especially on YouTube uh, and seeing that it worked. Cause I don't think you would have ever had that without, um, uh, COVID because you know a lot of a lot of comedy a lot of people don't know is, is they're bringer shows so you have to bring somebody in order to perform uh, and I I always hated that um, and that model is to kind of never changed but it was forced to with being online uh, but it forced a lot of things and one of the things I loved about COVID also was there was no traffic in Los Angeles <laughs> perfect yeah <laughs> during COVID could you act you could it was just kind of restricted sets um, you know, you wearing the mask, you go on to do your lines and then you take the mask off. Uh, it, it was very hard. I mean, it was very hard to get there. You know, a lot of stuff was shut down. Yeah. I couldn't imagine ever trying to get in the zone to do comedy or to remember lines when I'm wearing a mask and I have to hand sanitize every 20 minutes. I, I bound to been, I'd bound to kind of test whether you actually like comedy or acting. Oh, I, yeah, I agree. It's a total big test because, you know, you kind of feel like this is you're doing it because it's, you know, some of some, some of it's got to make you feel, be happy to do it. And it's got to make you not want to do it at all. Yeah, because I'm I've seen many comedians talk about how they they switch to kind of making skip videos and stuff during COVID because it was kind of like they were faced with a challenge of, right, you really love this industry and you really want to be a part of it go and find a way to make it work it was kind of you couldn't sit back and blame covid because everyone was blaming covid you had to find some way to do it and i think that is probably the comedians that blew up over covid and that are still around that's probably why they why they had such a jump in skill it's probably why they became so good because they had no other choice you had to sink or swim you had to find a way to do it oh yeah absolutely and then you have <clears throat> you know, all the people that had the excuses of I couldn't, they can't do comedy because I have to work. And then they're at home. They don't have anything else to do. It was a perfect <laughs> time to do all that. So to round off podcast on something, I, I, I don't even know how to pose this, but I have to ask someone who is involved in comedy and acting. What, what's going on with Cat Williams? <laughs> I have, I don't know. I think he's a hilarious guy. Um, but 
I don't know him personally, so I don't know what it is that he's going through. Uh, he's certainly entertaining. Yeah, I. Everyone keeps talking about it on like such a bad light and stuff, but I just I I've watched him for so many years, and I just I know how funny and how smart and how like talented he is. I just, I, there's something that tells me that he's he's struck a deal with all these people that he's he's making fun of and he's making these stories of, and he must be releasing something incredible. There's no other explanation. I just, you know, if I, you know, when I've met people who have a lot of money or have a lot of fame, um, it, it's, it's access. It's access to a lot of people who are listening to you and a lot of people kind of are relying on you. Um, and then you, you know, just like you and I talking, uh, it's a great conversation. You feel like, you, you know, it's okay. I can freely say stuff, but even stuff that I'm saying right now, there it might offend people. And so people are going to come, but there's going to be backlash. People aren't, aren't going to like it. Um, so somebody in his situation who's so popular like he is, and then for him to say anything negative, then people are going to jump on that, you know? Yeah, I'd seen, I obviously, I watched the interview with Shannon Sharp that went incredibly viral, but I was looking at some of the comments because I just wanted to see what people were thinking about the situation. And I saw a comment that was so amazing. Someone said that if this was too people sitting in the exact same positions having a conversation and the video had 10 views there would be zero uproar or zero conspiracies happening it's just because he is cat williams maybe he just wanted to sit down with shannon sharp and have a normal conversation yeah and you know what we're in the we're the news has changed so much media has changed so much that i mean they can make a story out of nothing and get you all excited about it and so anytime somebody's saying something that could be construed as I can take this story because the media take a story for free and turn it into a money making machine for themselves uh, and manipulate anything that they want. So, you know, because I don't know him personally and kind of like with anybody else that I don't know personally, I just respect anybody that is a comedian or, you know, anybody that can put this, themselves out there like that. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know him, so I don't have anything negative to say about him, but I can definitely see how, you know, all these people go nuts over it. Yeah, I suppose that is probably the the downside of uh, social media rising and comedy and acting is people are probably expecting some some sort of drama. Like, are you kind of whenever you are posting on social media for your your stuff, are you kind of putting in the back of your mind like I do kind of need to put something on here that's a twist that people will talk about. That is, but if if I have people, if I have somebody, and I have had this that contact me and say I didn't like your video, I'll take it down. Because uh, I love to do, I love to film famous graves, and so I love going to cemeteries to film uh, famous people. Uh, and I've had family members that said, "Hey, I don't want you to post, you know, my father or whatever his grave." Oh, okay, yeah. no problem. You know, no problem. There's other people that they're because they're making money off of it. Uh, they don't want to listen to it, but. Um, to me, I think you you always want to listen to your audience. Uh, and if there is that one person that, uh, you know, because there's videos that I see that I get upset about, especially about epilepsy and seizures, uh, and those people make money off of them and they won't take them down. Yeah, that though, that's the problem with power, as we spoke before, is as long as you have the power, you kind of disregard everything else. It's kind of like we spoke about earlier about, you know, you see someone on TV running down the road with a knife and you kind of think, you know, it's very clear to see that person's mentally ill, but if they turned around and said this person's mentally ill, nobody would care. Nobody would click. Nobody would look at us. They have to turn around and blow it up and make an example out of them. So I think that's, that is the thing with social media is it's not just as easy as putting your message across or getting your videos out. I, I taught, I've spoke about it before on a different episode of kind of these big people like, Andrew Tate and things like they have a message but if they just sat in front of a camera and said their message no one would care it wouldn't be entertaining they need to make it you know, they need to make it with fireworks they need to make it with big titles clickbait and sounds and backgrounds so people can people can care about what they're trying to say yeah I mean there's you know so many people are invested the reality is there's a lot of people that don't have uh, anything to do uh, and so they get so invested they kind of go down that rabbit hole of of uh, you know I, this is i have to find justice in you know this story and in reality no, really nobody does care yeah we just move, we, we just move, yeah we move on to the next story that's that's the problem unfortunately in social media is there's always another story and the best way to kill a story is with another story yeah absolutely um i thoroughly enjoyed this to be fair i think this has been 
it's been a lot better than I expected, to be honest. We've covered quite the range of topics <laughs> coming from law enforcement to Cat Williams, but uh <laughs> but yeah, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed having you on. You were uh incredible to speak to. The conversation was really, really easy and I, I can't wait to now edit this episode because I think I've I missed a lot of gems that we've dropped that probably looked over at the time. I do too, it was a lot of fun. Good to have you, Mike. Thank you very much. And I have no doubt I'll have you back on in the future. That'd be great. Thanks so much. And I'll, Thank I'll, you very I'll much. also post this. Yep, that would be very much appreciated, Mike. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, you too. Bye. All right.